So, Anne, it's my great pleasure to introduce your final workshop um, and to celebrate your uh, receiving of the UC Louvain 2022 Chef Frankie Award. We've already received four super interesting workshops from you, crossing a range of psychology uh, domains and also using a variety of methods. And I wanted to kind of use that, uh, that methods uh, point in order just to say something very small to initiate this, uh, this lecture. And I wanted to say that uh, Jan and myself, we've uh, developed in uh, UC, UC Louvain, we developed a methods course which is intended for bachelor students and master students. And we really set out this course to be based on qualitative methods and quantitative me methods in equal amounts. Jan is a specialist in qualitative, I'm a specialist in quantitative, and we really wanted to train our students in understanding the value of those two methods for psychology research. And actually, in the presentation by Anne, over these course of workshops, she's used different, she's presented different methods, the, diff the two different methods, qualitative and quantitative, and really shown the value of those two methods. And it was quite striking to me, as a specialist in quantitative, that the last workshop, last, uh, last week, I think, right? Last, uh, the last workshop was really on uh, quantitative methods, and it was very nice, you know, very good methods, very systematic manipulations, but actually, the meaning was quite small, you know, so the value that it adds to understanding behavior was something, but quite small. And qualitative, on the other hand, actually give a full picture to understanding human behavior. And so it was quite a nice way of contrasting those two methods, or quite nice to see the contrast in those two methods, and the real value, the asset that those two methods bring when they're combined together into a research program. So I think this is great that you presented this, and certainly I'm really pleased that we're recording that because we can use that, in fact, to show to our students what is the relative value of the two methods and what value does it bring to understanding human behavior. So that's all I want to say. Um, um, so I really uh, want to really now say that this is the, the final workshop, so I want to thank you on behalf of the Research Institute and the faculty for your presentations uh, to, uh, to us in, uh, in UC Louvain. And um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Anne. But after Anne, I'm going to invite you to ask questions, small discussion, and then Stefan is going to make a small presentation on behalf of the organization committee. And then finally, there's a drink outside. Okay, so <laughs> thank you very much, Anne. Thank you, Martin, and um, good evening, everyone. I'm really, really happy that you are all here because the inaugural was still in COVID time and then uh, there were only um, a few amount of people, so now I'm really, really happy that all of you are here. The inaugural in February was a walk through some beautiful parts of the field of family psychology, and I will not take you on that walk again tonight, not the whole way anyway. I'd rather talk about the perspectives that were added and the nuance that was provided by the many discussions the inaugural lecture provoked. About how this discussion sharpens my thinking and how this confirms in a very pleasant way my point of departure. What happens between people is what really matters. Indeed, I have always been particularly fascinated by the way the world between individuals can help us understand, explain, predict, and even change behavior. For how we uh, interact and relate to each other is very closely linked to who we are, what we think and feel, and how we behave. An interesting way to look at this interpersonal world is through a narrative lens. Through storytelling, by definition, an interpersonal act, even with an imaginary audience, we learn the social rules, we form our identity, and we become culturally socialized. Stories enable us to stay meaningful in the world. They shape our lives. They are central to every human being and indeed to what makes us human. People as storytellers and lives unfolding as they are told. To me, this is an interesting and useful metaphor in many ways. 
At the same time, it's clear that not everyone can participate in just any story or just talk their way in and out of everything. There are clearly issues of agency and power that, be, that go beyond individuals, interactions, and relationships. That is why, in the inaugural, I zoomed in on the question of privilege and oppression in storytelling and on the role of social location on the basis of such characteristics as gender, race, social class, sexual or gender orientation, nationality or disability. And that is where the difference came in between, on the one hand, the little stories we tell each other every day, and on the other hand, the grand narratives we pass down from generation to generation. Grand narratives are strongly cultural embedded and go hand in hand with social expectations and standards. They provide a kind of roadmap to what it means to be part of a system, part of a culture, a community, a family, a, family, a faculty. They inspire us for life, love, and death. They are the world to person narratives that we primarily undergo. Think about the happily ever after marriage plot, the blood is thicker than water saying, the neoliberal American dream, or the suburbia life plot. In Dutch we say, hushet on to boom people. We all, at some point, feel the social expectations and standards of one or another grand narrative. As an academic, as a parent, a partner, a son, a daughter, a neighbor, a friend, a sibling, a colleague, a teacher, a client, and many more. Because their impact cannot be underestimated, it's absolutely crucial to be critical of the status quo they serve, both in privilege and oppression. And then little stories, on the other hand, are the everyday talk through which we actively shape, do, and talk the unique reality of our lives. They are the person-to-world narratives, the way we construct and maintain relationship, create ties, legitimate identities, negotiate boundaries, and assign rights, responsibilities, and roles. Little stories are especially, especially serve a social connecting role, which lies in ordinary and everyday activities, such as having a meal together, coming to a talk, playing, having a meeting, providing and receiving mundane updates on storylines. The inaugural was mainly about the dynamics between the grand narratives and the little stories, and about the idea that these are strongly dependent on social location. The further one is socially distanced from the grand narrative and its accompanying social expectations and standards, the more one's own little story will be marginalized, and the harder it will be to get the own little story told. Or put otherwise, if you are not white, not male, not straight, not educated, not middle class, not cisgender, not Eurocentric, and especially a combination of these, then chances are higher that the mythical standard of the grand narratives puts pressure on or even suppresses your little story. Based on the idea that who we relate to and how we interact is closely linked to our identity and that the interaction between social location and systems of privilege and oppression is embedded in institutions, a focus on families makes sense. Indeed, we are produced, located, supported, and oppressed in families. And although family is a fluid and ambiguous concept constructed by its members and thus changing from person to person and from time to time, families are the way we organize our sexual, reproductive, economic, and intimate lives. Family members shape, do, and talk the unique reality of their family through their little story, through everyday talk and activities in which they reassure, acknowledge, nurture, reject, dominate, and encourage each other. It takes a lot of relational work, a lot of doing and talking to create a family identity, especially since families do not develop in a social vacuum and are constantly exposed by the social expectations and standards of the grand narratives. The slide shows the nuclear family pictured at the heart of the grand narrative and other types of families more socially distanced. The day-to-day -day relational work we refer to as doing family or, with the emphasis on narratives, talking family. This is really at the heart of what our group has been doing, 
doing and talking family, or how people do and talk themselves in and out families. As grand narratives create all kinds of inequalities, doing and talking family is then dependent on where the family is socially located. Little stories of families located outside the grand narrative are typically marginalized. These families have to reinvent their concept of family to fit their unique story and have then to face pressure and even suppression. The grand narrative blood is thicker than water, for instance, and the equivalent sayings like father like son <coughs> or the apple doesn't fall far from the tree are quite salient and strongly rooted in the, our culture. Their social expectation and standards di dictate that the nuclear family is the family per excellence, in which children are socialized by their parents, blood ties spontaneously and automatically imply mutual love. They also imply that there is no escape for the parent-child relationship is involuntary and inseparably linked to genetic kinship. <coughs> Our research with families that are not completely genetically related to each other reveal that dealing with the genetic imbalance requires quite a bit of relational work of doing and talking family. Lesbian families, for instance, are confronted with heteronormative traditions such as Father's Day or Mother's Day. Donor families with resemblance talk and adoptees with very private questions from strangers, asking them all the time where they come from and whether their biological parents are still alive. In all of these cases, the confrontation with the outer world leads to feelings of being different, being outside the plot of the grand narrative, while the everyday experience within the family is one of simply being a harmonious, complete, and normal family. Socially distant families thus have to reinvent the concept of family to fit their unique story, which requires extra doing and talking. The larger symbols on the slide are therefore not an indication of louder voices, but rather refer to more doing and talking. A consistent finding in our research with families outside the plot of grand narratives is that their little stories contain ambivalent statements and inconsistencies. Families with a ge genetical imbalance, for instance, minimize genetics, but at the same time consider it very relevant. That is, families typically and firmly state that there is no difference between genetically and non-genetically related family members. There is no difference. Only to contradict themselves within minutes. They express, for instance, a strong preference for using the same sperm donor for subsequent conceptions in order to create real Kind, kinship bonds. Or they spend extra time with their donor child because they might have to catch something up, up after all. Or they want to go the extra mile because the natural bond is missing anyway. And thus carry the baby more often when they go for a walk or give the bottle or change the nappies more often. Ditto for the donor. Families often say that the donor plays no role in their lives. It's just something we got from the hospital to call him daddy just a few minutes later when they talk about the characteristic of the child, such as striking red hair or a talent for dancing he got from his father. So the storytellers alternate between erasing the donor and putting him to the fore and between minimizing genetics and giving it a prominent place. This dialectical tension is accompanied by inconsistencies in little stories that are by no means pe peculiar to the storytellers, but arise from the confrontation between, with the grand narrative. So much for the evidence-based reasoning I developed in the inaugural. Summarizing, becoming and being a family happens in the doing and talking, in which both dynamics within the family and those between the family and the outside world play a role. This is reflected in a unique little family story and in how stories relate to the grand narrative with their social expectations and prescribed standards. The amount of difficulty of doing and talking family <coughs> reflects the family's agency and depends on the social position of the family towards the plot of the grand narrative. So that the little stories of more socially distanced families are more ambivalent and inconsistent. 
The discussions following the inaugural showed that both the metaphor of doing and talking family and that of the grand narrative versus little stories do have potential to advance our thinking, especially about those families that find themselves socially located outside the plot. But as the in Ghent, at least in Ghent, very famous saying goes, every way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. Our discussions reveal quite a bit of not seeing mainly around the binary, grand narrative versus little story. Questioning the binary gives rise to nuance and a range of other perspectives. In a nutshell, the binary approach was challenged by an evolving dialogue between perspectives and a multitude of stories. It above all made the question of agency far more complex and brought nuance to the role of social location and the meaning of inconsistencies. In the end, it made me change one single word in the sentence I used to close my inaugural. But that one word makes all the difference in how we look at families. If that is not exciting and promising for the rest of my talk. Let's start at the drawback of binary thinking. Hanging the story on the difference between grand narratives and little stories was often discussed as too categorical and dualistic, an oversimplification of a complex reality and therefore missing nuance. The validity of the binary was questioned and regarded with suspicion. As Snow would say it, the drawback of binary thinking is the number two. In, op in opposites, one of the two always assumes the dominant role, overtly or covertly, as in man-woman, Ratio emotion, science art, body soul, qualitative quantitative, and grand narrative little story. We zoomed in on the value of perspectives on perspectives in workshop three, in which we discussed the rhetorical method of a never ending evolving dialogue between perspectives as a response to dualistic thinking. A variety of levels of storytelling in addition to grand narratives and little stories came up including family ideologies, memes, metaphors, ideas, phrases, images, symbols, and stories that are specific to a family but go beyond one generation. And it became clear that each of them could offer different perspectives on the nature, purpose, and functioning of the family, as well as on research questions, design, and method. The binary grand narrative versus little story is rooted in the perspective of families as political systems, families as the cornerstone of society that undergo the social expectations and standards of that grand narrative. From this perspective, it's very logical to study the little stories from marginalized families through designs that capture flexibility and acknowledge different and fluid ways of doing and talking family. It is clear, however, that this in itself is a reaction, a kind of, a kind of counter narrative against a dominant research perspective in which families that are socially located outside the grand narrative are compared with families inside the narrative to find out what exactly the difference are. No matter how often reviewers insist, insisted on such, on such comparative research, we always and consistently refused. For any comparison of families is normative and based on an assumption of what a control or normal or healthy family is. Such a research design would serve the status quo. Because we, what, ex what exactly is such a control, normal or healthy family? A family that conforms to the narrow social expectations and standards of the grand narratives? So a cisgender, heterosexual, Eurocentric middle class family? Paradoxically, however, this counter-narrative and anti-categorical attitude in research methods goes hand in hand with a categorical and even binary perspective on stories and their role for family identity. In the discussions we had, it became very clear that this way of seeing is absolutely also a way of not seeing. It is probably close to what Burke would call a trained incapacity, how a story allows us to think and act in a particular way, but also prevents us from, be, from choosing alternative ways. And these alternative ways 
that came up and included, for example, families as living organisms or systems in flux and transformation. If you look at families as systems in flux and transformation, you end up with a completely different research design with more dynamic and less static top-down processes. Another perspective is to see families as instruments of domination, close to the feminist reading of, fam of families as oppression and status quo of gender roles. There were certainly traces of the dark side of families in some of our family stories, although the critique of the ideology of love and, and that emphasis oppression was never part of our research design or questions. Some of the stories were very close to yet another perspective on families, namely cultural constructs, with, for instance, the family of choice or family as a warm nest. And of course, these different perspectives can intersect in complex, sometimes paradoxical ways, so that most likely no single perspective is unambiguously problematic or stigmatizing, nor good or empowering. This was precisely the focus and the discussion in the second workshop around what Chimamanda Adichie so rightly describes as the danger of a single story. Adichie convincingly argues that who we are, who we are, because of a lot of stories. And indeed, families are who they are because of a lot of stories. Because of the story that the family is different, being blended, adoptive, single parent, foster, disabled, divorced, donor conceived, sexual minority, interracial or poor. But equally because of the story that the family is similar, being harmonious, healthy and normal. That puts the significance of inconsistencies in families in a very different perspective. In the inaugural, I emphasized that inconsistencies are signs of dialectical tension, that the idea is consistent with the binary approach. Opposites result in dialectical tension. But if we let go of the binary and embrace the idea that families are who they are because of a lot of a myriad of stories, then inconsistencies are not necessarily the result of dialectical tension, but of different stories existing side by side. They then are signs of good functioning rather than difficulties. So Nietzsche's phrase from Beyond Good and Evil that I used in the inaugural now really fits. Contradictions are signs of health. Everything absolute belongs to pathology. To insist on consistency would be to insist on only one story, thereby, thereby, thereby overlooking many other stories and possibilities. A single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes, Adichie points out, is that they are incomplete. They make one story the only story. So the story that the donor is something the family got from the hospital is one story. And the donor and the story that this donor is like a father is just another story. It's not a contradiction. It's just another story because of which the family is who the family is. And many other donor stories can exist side by side. In fact, the words family members use to refer to the donor are very diverse and illustrate many different stories because of which they are who they are. In some stories, families position the donor in relation to the nuclear family. In another story, they secure the role of the non-genetic par parent. In yet another story, they clarify the family structure or present a positive image of the donor. The donor-conceived identity is then what it is because of all of these stories. <coughs> Along with the paradigm shift to a much richer diversity than the binary, came also a wider scope for argument related to agency. The agency lies in not having to coincide with one single story, in the possibility to tell many different stories. It would, however, be an illusion to endow a family with ominous powers and deny the relevance of pre-existing narratives in the construction of family identity. Not every family can just tell themselves in and out everything. The social expectations and standards of pre-existing narratives do impact family stories. There are issues of power and status quo, both in privilege and oppression. At the same time, family stories can talk back. 
to understand the agency direction of fit between the family and the world and who is in control, we focused in the second workshop on power and agency in both the world to family and the family to world fit. We discussed that stories can both reflect and make reality. When stories reflect reality, the focus is on how lives are constructed by pre-existing narratives and how language is transparent and provides insight into what to study. This side of the spectrum leaves rather little space for alternative stories or agency. On the other hand, the focus is on how families are agentically constructing their lives by engaging in storytelling. The family is then seen as agentic and uses language to create reality. There are indeed cases where it is precisely in family stories that the agency emerges. Cases in which families talk back to pre-existing narratives. Oppression and inequality, for instance, occur in families and have serious negative consequences. The standard that family relationships are non-voluntary leaves no room for an appropriate detached response to inequalities, abuse of power, or conflict. However, in such unhealthy family situations, the status quo cannot be tolerated. Our research on divorce and children, for instance, has shown that children have difficulty dealing with family conflict. In this sense, divorce can be a very healthy response to an unhealthy situation if it creates a less conflicting family environment. To divorce is to stop something that no longer works. Here, the agency lies in the story of the divorced family that talks back to the standard of the indivisible nuclear family. Bringing these stories out into the open can ensure that family estrangement and distance is no longer a taboo, but also a story that can be told. One story alongside many other stories of love and understanding in families. However, distance in families cannot be narrowed down to one story either. For some, it's a sign of love. For others, it's a healthy reaction to an unhealthy situation. The possibilities of how family members relate to each other could be much more diverse and richer if more different stories could be told. In our discussions, many more complexities occurred of the talking family metaphor that go beyond the agency direction of the fit between the person and the world, such as the difficulty of identifying tellership. All, all stories are told in interaction and thus negotiated by multiple co-tellers that all contribute, including the invisible ones and the listeners. After all, a story tells as much about the teller as it does about the audience to whom is it told. I was only too aware of that when I wrote this story. Many of you were very prominent in my head. The question of who owns the tellership is closely related to the question of who has the agency. Stories are complicated in the sense that it's difficult to disentangle who is telling what, let alone who is telling what role, or who wants to be understood how. A related issue is the exclusion from tellership. Those who are not part of the storytelling do not learn the social rules, do not get socialized, and are not part of relationships, groups, communities, or society. Or one could also say that just by being an outsider, they do influence the storyteller, but identify in a negative way. Think about women in old boys' networks, black sheep, newcomers in a culture, people in poverty, or families that deviate from the standard. It makes a substantial difference whether you are in or out the story, whether you can or cannot participate in the storytelling. The fact that stories are embedded in interaction makes them particularly difficult to study. In research, stories are in fact covered by an extra layer of post hoc construction and the reflective discourse in which family members want to present themselves in a rational, logical, and coherent way. The story does not surface in the family context, but in the context of research. It is therefore a meta story in which family members explore and present the self at the level of the talked about as a character in a new story. Here too, the idea of tellership is important because the here and now of the research context and the researcher fully participate in the storytelling. That is why 
talking science differs from talking family because a new story is created. In many cases, for instance, the questions we ask the family members seem to challenge them in the sense that they brought to the fore issues that hardly ever surface in their everyday interactions. Think of the donor-conceived families. It happened that interview questions confronted them with the genetic imbalance, whether in everyday life they considered themselves to a complete, normal, and harmonious family. The issue was discussed on several occasions, leading to a critical awareness of the different assumptions or logics in which the family members and researchers' metaphors are grounded, and to reflection on the power imbalances, politics, and ethics that underpin family research. After all, talking science is a story in itself, with its expectations and standards, and creates new stories in co-construction with the families. So far, we have zoomed in on the importance of how many stories are told, how they are told, and who tells them. What remains is the role of social location. As you may recall, I started using social location primarily to situate families in and out the central plot of grand narratives, where socially distanced families have to do the extra doing and talking to get their story told. Here, too, a kind of categorical thinking has crept, in assuming, <coughs> has crept in, assuming that, at least implicitly, somewhere close to the central plot of the grand narrative, there are families that experience no oppression, no inequality, no problems. Families for whom doing and talking family just goes without saying, literally. But we don't really know. We did not include families who are in a socially privileged location because we assumed that they would not be able to tell us about the relational work needed to deal with imbalance. However, given the nuance that was added that all families have a myriad of stories to tell and that the inconsistencies between these stories is, are a sign of health rather than stress, all families might have difficulty in telling one or another story. Undoubtedly, a white, cisgender, heterosexual, middle-class family will experience little inequality or oppression in these areas of their identity. But that does not guarantee that they will not face difficulty in other areas and, and experience, for instance, emotional distance, loss, uncertainty, insecurity, conflict, or failure. Through such an experience, any family will find it difficult to doing and talking family to reassure and support each other and to deal with the pressure of the outside world. And family identities also overlap, since the best interest of the child and mattering to each other are the typical drives for their doing and, family, uh, doing, doing and talking. That is what families have in common, whether they are cisgender, transgender, mixed, disabled, donor, nuclear, adopted, or otherwise. Being locked into a single story is limiting for any family. Even a success story is just one story that can be equally, equally limiting. Of course, we cannot be blind to social injustice, and the influence certainly does not stop at the border of the family. Social location is undeniably important, and socially distanced families do experience pressure and tension. Above all, the discussion should be seen as a nuance and as a reaction against the dualistic thinking that is very quickly taking root in thinking about families. In this case, it could lead to an artificial distinction between, between families with and without problems. And so various arguments lead to the conclusion that it's important that a multitude of stories can be told. Because families are who they are because of all those stories. And no one should be trapped in one single story or identity. And because social expectations and standards become more open, and also because social expectations and standards become more open this way and less mythical, and as a result, in turn, makes room for more stories to be told. So we finally arrive at the lions. Until the lions have a voice, the glory of the hunt will always be the tale of the hunter. This proverb that I borrowed from the Nigerian novelist, the Chibi, articulates what I was trying to say. All that now remains for me is to explain how a whole discussion led to the change of one word and how that one word makes all the difference. 
based on the proverb about alliance and the central importance I had given to social location, I ended my inaugural with the plea to be the voice of the lions. After a convincing discussion, however, it became crystal clear that we cannot be the voice of the lions. What we can do is give voice to the lions. This one word difference does reflect a very different vision. And that's important, especially when we are talking about science. Doing science, we make decisions about the stories that are told, about how they are told, and about who tells them. We not only tell someone else's story, we also have the power to make it the definite, the only story of that person, or to give that person a voice to tell many stories. If we give the lions a voice to tell their many stories, we will have to deal with ambivalence and inconsistency in our research. And so inconsistency is an interesting research topic in itself. It is not necessarily noise, and we should not question inconsistent individuals. They may think very carefully about questions and answer them with equal thoughtfulness. It is simply impossible to deal with people without dealing with all their stories, including the contradictions between them. It's about what Chibi calls a balance of stories. A balance of stories, another beautiful metaphor. Definitely a way of seeing, just as surely a way of not seeing that will again provoke nuance and new perspectives. This is exactly how science advances through an ever-evolving dialogue. It was an absolute privilege to participate in that dialogue through the Franqui chair at UC Louvain. <coughs> and I want to thank all of you very sincerely for organizing, for listening, for speaking, for bringing perspectives to perspectives. I hope we will continue the dialogue. Because there is one thing I'm really convinced of, and I always will be, what really matters is what happens between people. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk, I have a question then. Um, I was wondering, so are the families all equipped enough in terms of emotional competences, for instance, to deal with this conflict. I mean, maybe the family that, um, that are healthy and have multiple voices are those who already have the equipment to do that. Um, and so the relations is inverse. So they talk together because they're equipped. Mm -hmm. It's not the other way around. It's a good question. Yeah, it's a very nice question, actually, because I think it's really true, because I've, I've focused a lot on the social location of the family and, and put that as, like, as a determinant of how, how the family functions. But of course, there's a whole lot of in, uh, dynamics within the family. And that's actually something I left out again, but we talked about in the, in the fourth workshop when we did the social relations model analysis. It's really what's going on in the family. And there, um, it's very nice that this um, quantitative method is, um, based on this method, you can distinguish um, individual uh, characteristics, relational characteristics, and family characteristics. So you can really see, um, is there an individual characteristic of the mother, the father, the children, in the way that they, um, how they are, and also how they are perceived? And then are there unique things within relationships? Because there could be a dysfunctional relationship. It could be that what the conflict is, for instance, in the parent and in the father-daughter relationship, and the rest is healthy. Yeah? And it, can, it can also be a recipro uh, reciprocal uh, thing or not. Yeah? And then it could also be a family thing. Yeah? It could be that in that family, there is something, there is kind of a culture or, or a way of, of handling things that is very different from other families. And that, so it's a very good question. It's something that I left out of the, of the talk that we discussed in the fourth. Uh, um, that's what Martin said, the quantitative work that I uh, tend to leave out. <laughs> it's, it's very true what you say. Thank you very much for your talk. I was uh, your talk, your talks. I was very interested in them, as I am myself a non-normative uh, family. 
And um, in your first or second talk, I don't remember, you, you give um, a number of examples of these inconsistencies that can be found in the discourse of non-normative families and especially uh, lesbian families. And I reflected on these and on all the inconsistency that I could also perceive in normative families uh, that surrounds me. For example, um, my neighbor saying, a, a, a man, uh, women are terrible drivers, only to contradict himself a minute later by saying that women are those who must do the, you know, the extracurricular uh, journeys to uh, the, the journeys to extracurricular activities, and that's not man's role. And um, uh, in my friends, I, I hear a lot of women saying like, men really suck at parenting tasks only to complain a minute later that their husbands are not involved enough in parenting. And so um, I was wondering, uh, based on all your research, what, is the, what would be the difference between the in inconsistencies that can be found in non-normative families and the inconsistency that inconsistencies that can be found in normative families. Yeah. Do they differ in numbers, like yeah. quantitatively or qualitatively? What would yeah, you okay. About? Yeah, very nice question. Actually, uh, it was because of the comment you give that I started reflecting on, because you said, and it's really true, I, I focus too much on inconsistencies or really characteristics of socially distant families because of this tension between grand narratives and little stories. And then you said, no, I can also see that, that there are in, in normal, in, in, in families that are very central in the grand narrative. And then I started reflecting on this, and I think you're right. First thing is, I can't answer from a research perspective because we didn't include them, yeah? So, because we didn't want to be anti, uh, categorical, and being so anti-categorical, we were very categorical, yeah. That's what I was trying to say. But the thing is, what I presented today, I think that um, because we are by so many stories, that the story of uh, women are bad drivers and women are responsible for uh, outdoor uh, um, uh, activities, that they could coexist. It's, that, that could well be, because it's another part of, how, of, of looking at women and things like that. So I would say, luckily your neighbor doesn't only say that women are bad drivers, yeah, that he also has another story on, on women that he contradicts himself. It's probably not because of the, of the clash between, with the grand narrative, but it's because for him, we, women are what they are because of many stories. And that's exactly, I think, the point that I wanted to make today, that, that we should just live with that. It's, it's not um, a sign of tension. It's more a sign of being healthy, yeah? Because the more stories you can tell, um, the, the, the better it is, yeah? If you can say that you're vulnerable and, and, and make mistakes, at the same time saying that you're very good at what you do, that, that's really healthy, I think, and it doesn't really depend on your social location. I think that's the difference with the inaugural. And it, you really, your questions provoke that in me, in my, in my thinking. So thank you. <laughs> now I'm afraid. <laughs> I know this person. Is that a small or a grand narrative? I have a question on, on voice, and I come from a different form of social sort of pedagogy. But because we have the discussion on, you cannot. I, I understand your, your shift from be the voice to give the voice, which, which I would agree with. But I would go a step further that we we also cannot give a voice. It's about they have a voice, yeah, and it's it's that, for us to listen and to. Yeah, and I was I was wondering how you look at the notion of verbality also. Well, what do you what is a voice and a narrative and I work with vulnerable families of course or which can hitting your child be a be a voice yes or is it is it a narrative in terms of words no knowing what happened in your story in your story or and being able to explain it and in a way mm. that the other person understands it or, or yeah. is it our capacity that we need to listen to the line that yeah. maybe bites us sometimes Certainly do, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, two things run through my head. Um, that's why we don't only um, talk about talking family, but also doing family, because it's more than talking. And the second thing is, I, in the inaugural, I, I started with that, that um, what happens between people doesn't have to be 
um, verbal at all. And I give the example that if you, for instance, we, um, after this question, two, two days later, we meet, you're on the other um, side of the street and I'll wave to you and you don't wave back, yeah? That's something that will um, <coughs> iterate in my head and I will think, What's, what's going on, yeah? Is he still mad at me because I answered it <laughs> completely? <laughs> but so it doesn't have to be verbal at all. It doesn't have to be intentional at all. And I, it, yeah, but it's, it's very good because I left it out and it's true. It's, uh, and that's, I think, why doing family is also very important. It's also like having a meal together and doing our, all kinds of things that are not verbal, yeah, absolutely. And I agree also with the, with the voice, they have a voice. It's more like, yeah, let us listen to the voice. So I, I'll change it again. <laughs> to go together with Judy a step beyond. No, I'm really afraid. <laughs> it's also about ownership. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have that little song in, in Dutch from Baudouin de Groot, Tante Julia. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of Tante Julia's talking through our voice, and we think these are our, our ideas, but part is made by the grand narrative we live in, and part is made by the family members we are confronted with mm -hmm. while we are talking. Mm -hmm. So if you try to grab the voice of somebody, you grab the voice of many people behind the person who is perhaps seen as voiceless. So I, I yeah. really like the idea that you move from um, lead a voice to give a voice to the question, who is the owner of the voice? Yeah. Is it the person we talk to or is it the, 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 the community he or she belongs? Yeah, that's what, yeah, exactly. And it's about agency, yeah? And that's why I want to say also the invisible ones, yeah? If, uh, we, we, do all, we also do that exercise when we work with mediators, yeah? We have the two ex-partners in the room, they're trying to get divorced, and then we ask them, who is in the room? <laughs> you know, a lot of people are in the room. Yeah? The children are in the room, but also the neighbors, and also the, the parents who have said, uh, you can see that uh, the house will be yours even after divorce, so a lot of people are there in the room, and it's, it's very true, and it's about ownership, about agency. Yeah. That's why I said I think that the, the um, issue of agency became much more complex when we left the binary. And, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, well, please. Well, I'll try to explain my questions quite simply in my head. That's um, good. <laughs> We could. Um, where is it? Uh, so, regarding narratives, we have uh, brand narratives and little narratives. And I was thinking, maybe we have also specific uh, stories and general stories. I was really thinking about how people or families are accepting their identity. And so, I was wondering if they have more uh, specific uh, narratives or specific stories. Will they, will Will they be more willing to accept their identity, even if it's grand or little narratives? I don't know if I'm... And could, could you give an example of a specific and a more general narrative? Yeah, I would say um, little, a little story is more a little uh, narrative. It would be more about a minority family, a minority, uh, well, a marginalized family. It could be something that uh, we don't see on average. But uh, a specific narrative would be really uh, if the person is more um, uh, has more conscious, conscious is more conscious about uh, something like I am who I am because this specific event, mm. this specific, I, I'm um, linking, linking it to the yeah. October uh, It's at the core of my identity, yeah, yeah. and then more it's a, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, more distant, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting idea. That, that, and it it'd certainly be true that some, some aspects of your identity are really at the core yeah, and are, not, uh, are very stable and then others are more uh, not, not as central, more distant yeah, and are more general and maybe not that important and, and are more fluent and fluid 
and will change over time. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting idea, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I uh, thank you, Anne, for your presentation, and I'd like to now invite Stefan to. I don't think it's working, so I'll try to speak out loud. Cher uh, Professor Buysen, beste Anne, um, I'd like to say a few words on behalf of the organizing committee of the 2020 uh, Frankie Cher. Um, and as we are a mixed audience, Dutch and French, I use the good Belgian habit of saying things in English. And, um, I think it's uh, the best way also to communicate. Communication is important. When the organizing committee um, made the choice of inviting you as the laureate of the 2022 Frankie Share uh, in Psychology, we took a safe bet. And pardon me for making uh, maybe some commercial advertisements for betting. That was not my intention. But we made a bet because we knew, of course, that uh, you have an excellent reputation as a researcher and as a teacher. And we knew that we were going to have an excellent series of lectures ahead of us and that we would all learn from it. It would be very complementary also to our teaching and our research here. And I can tell you, you did not let us down at all, on the very contrary. The five lectures that you gave us, or actually, I should say, two lectures, three workshops, and I know you preferred to give the workshops to the lectures, they gave us a wonderful insight uh, and a wonderful flavor of your research in family processes, family psychology, and more precisely, the processes of influencing uh, in families on various topics like blended and reconstituted families, adoption, attachment, family therapy, donorship, divorce, uh, same-sex families, and so on. Um, one could think that with such a list of, uh, of heavy-handed topics this would be difficult to digest, but that was definitely not the case. Um, as a very good chef, you did not make difficult things very difficult to digest, but you gave them to us in the form of, I would almost say, a smorgasbord of nice things to choose from, to savor, to, to taste from, and to learn from. Uh, and so we learned about things like grand narratives and small stories. Uh, we learned about talk, and you talked about talk today as well, the importance of talk, not just to communicate within families, between couples, between family members, but also as a way to construe, to construct, to make families, to build family stories. We learned, as you mentioned again today and illustrated, and uh, as also was mentioned before, we learned about qualitative and quantitative met methods and how they can, can, can really complement each other in understanding more and to not stick to the the, the paths that we all know and like to sometimes follow while there's so much else out there. We learned about culture and context and how they influence families. We learned about the importance of contradictions and the fact that contradictions are acceptable and necessary. We learned about inconsistencies. We learned about agency. All of this, uh, I think, was really spread out before us and we could taste like a smorgasbord. Although maybe smorgasbord was not the best comparison, and not just because it's always uh, a bit uh, ir irrespectable to compare good research to food, but if I may anyway, I think maybe it was a bit more like sushi, because in a sushi you can see the chef cooking and making and preparing things. And this is also what you did. You did not only introduce us to a number of very interesting insights, but you also drew from your own experience, of course your academic experience, but also your experience as somebody who runs a family, has run a family, and has been dealing with a number of the issues that you presented out. And that, of course, made, makes it all the, more, all the more telling and more appealing and much more lived in and lived through. So that's very much appreciated as well. 
Now going to relationships, one of the people and one of the persons with whom you have intensively collaborated and have what I would call a special relationship is someone who is also here. It's our colleague Jan de Mol. And um, I think Jan uh, and you are partners in crime, but in a very mutually constructive way. Uh, crime, in this case, uh, not being in the negative way. Um, you were his PhD promoter, and now he is here as a promoter of your Frankie share. So, if I may, I think this is uh, almost uh, in, 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 in an example or an application of social exchange theory, theory and how this can actually be mutually constructive. But um, originally the idea was, or the, the wish would be that uh, Jan would also speak on behalf of the organizing committee, but he preferred uh, that I would give the text and I will read out his text as he has written it with the accents as he has put them also on the text. So, dear Anne, sorry, I have to say, dear Dean, dear Professor Buysen, these are Jan's words. You have now been re-elected as Dean at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences of Ghent University. Congratulations, but I do hope that you will not end up in a burnt out deanery but this is not what I really wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about the Franqui chair. The illusion still exists in our society that a family or a couple or parenthood must always be wonderful and perfect. Failure is not allowed because otherwise you have failed as a person. For example, when your child has behavioral problems, you as a parent have failed. And also divorce is still not really fully allowed in our society. You also and always have to justify why the part of the relationship did not succeed and had to stop. And if you look at how narcissism and perfectionism are on the rise in society, in a great rise, this all proves the point. This is what Balbi already said. When you cannot construct a real own identity, the only thing you can do is humiliate other people and present yourself as the better one. Dirk de Wachter, a psychiatrist with whom I, Jan, have worked with and who, of course, also gets a lot of criticism, he currently calls Flanders borderline Flanders. And that is, of course, the reason why I, Jan, started working in the French-speaking part of Belgium. <laughs> but during your lectures and workshops, you, were very well, you very well highlighted the complexities of a family, of a couple, of parenthood. A family, a couple, and parenting are never perfect. Given the complexities of interpersonal relationships, which you discussed as well, as well as the complexities of the social context, it is impossible that relationships are always perfect. Of course, people then say, Yes, but you must always do your best. But given the complexities, there is no definition of what it really means to do your best. In the first lecture, and then also in the consecutive workshops, you explained very well that sometimes one, thing's, one thing can be better and sometimes another can be better. It's impossible to know in advance which is better. And what you said, based on research, of course, but also has is based on research, but also has important implications for family therapy and for couple therapy. As a family or couple therapist, you are, of course, confronted with these interpersonal complexities, and you may allow yourself not to understand everything, so not to be a perfectionist as a therapist. Arlene Anderson calls this the not knowing position as a therapist. So thank you, Anne, for putting the focus on those complexities and also on showing that everything in a family or a couple can also suddenly change without blaming the family members or the partners. You also emphasized the personal powers of people, the concept of agency. In interpersonal relationships and complexities, the focus is usually on the negative aspects, not only on, of relationships, but also of individual negative aspects within relationships. 
people's personal strengths are also very important from a therapeutic point of view. As a therapist, one cannot help people if one only focuses on the negative. People can only learn something about themselves in therapy if they also have an identity. So your focus on, on people's personal strengths was also very important. So Anne, no, sorry, dear Dean, dear Professor Börse, really thank you very much for your engagement during the lectures and workshops, and of course also for the content that you brought. And Jan gives you the permission to drink plenty of wine at the reception that will take place in a row. Thank you.